Great. Okay. So I have a very challenging, uh, challenging time ahead. It's post lunch, and I have to talk about Windows Azure cloud computing for Java developers. <clears throat> and uh, this is this is pretty challenging. The reason why I say that is, uh, how many of you watch uh, Tamil movies very often? Right. So. Uh, when I was actually flying from Hyderabad to Bangalore some time back, I, I actually watched a movie. And that was a typical Bollywood movie. And surprisingly, uh, I could actually watch the whole movie in that 80 hour flight in about one hour. And when I got down, I was, I was completely surprised because I didn't realize, but the flight actually condensed that movie, which is typically, uh, would, which would run for about two hour, 40 minutes, to about one hour. And I had the complete experience of watching that movie in one hour flight and I got down. So uh, my session is almost like that. It's a movie that is typically made for the movie halls, to be watched in a movie hall. But I'm going to deliver it in the uh, in-flight entertainment mode. right? So I'm going to condense this into a 40-minute session. So the challenge is, uh, how do you take a Bharti Raja movie and, and edit it to be watched in 40 minutes? Can you do it? It's very hard. Right? So that's the challenge I have in front of me. And uh, we keep uh, referring to movies uh, pretty often in my session because I'm going to show you something uh, related to movies and entertainment. And I'm going to keep this light and also uh, you know, make sure that you understand what is Azure uh, as, a, as a Java developer. There is another uh, strange thing to this session. <clears throat> I'm actually running um, Windows 7 on an Apple Mac, talking to Java developers about Microsoft Windows Azure. I mean, I, I think I can take the credit for delivering the most exhaustive session just in terms of interoperability, right? I have Apple, I have Microsoft, I have Sun, I have Oracle, and uh, somewhere I might use, uh, you know, Flash, um, and, and I have a plethora of technologies that I'm going to touch during this session. So I'm going to keep the format of this session very, very different. Um, how many of you got bored with the bulleted PowerPoint slide deck that we have been seeing for ages, right? I'm, I'm, I'm equally bored as a presenter. This is my third Great Indian Developer Summit. And this time, I wanted to experiment with a different visual language to talk to you. So I only have six slides and the customary thank you resources slide, and of course, the title slide. If I take the, those two off, I just have five slides and no bullets, right? OK, so let me get started. Uh, my objective for this session is to help you understand what is Windows Azure and what's in it for Java developers. I am no way promising that you can go attempt a Microsoft certification on Windows Azure. That's not the agenda at all. I want you to understand Windows Azure as a cloud computing platform and what can you do with it as a Java developer. Is that clear? All right. So what is cloud computing? You have been uh, attending sessions. Today morning, we had a fantastic keynote by Simon from Amazon. Um, so let me ask you, how many of you are uh, using Amazon Web Services or Google App Engine? OK, quite a few. I think just five, six of you. Uh, how many of you believe that cloud computing is the biggest hype cycle that's currently going through? OK, OK. And uh, how many believe that this is the future? This is what is going to change all our day-to-day -day jobs? Fantastic. I am one among you. I completely believe that cloud computing will change the way we actually work, right? So what is cloud computing? Uh, let me cut the hype and give you a very simple uh, view of cloud computing. So this is my slide format. Now, <clears throat> basically, cloud computing can be classified into three different layers. The first one is called infrastructure as a service, right? Now, infrastructure as a service is pretty simple. Uh, three, four years back, when we had to run a lab, a temporary lab for a week's time, what was the model? Uh, I come from Hyderabad, so I used to call a vendor in uh, Shanai Trade Center in Sikindrabad asked him to ship me 50 machines for one week. And we used to get these uh, Intel Pentium machines, and they used to charge us 4,000 rupees per day per PC. And we used to run it for about a week, get the training done, and send it back. Right? So that was basically desktops and a couple of servers on hire, on rent. Now, fast forward that to 2009, 2010, and the future. What has changed from? Uh, uh, someone shipping physical machines from Sikandrabad to high-tech city. Uh, the internet connectivity is ubiquitous. Well, I cannot say that because I have huge issues with the internet connectivity right away. But more or less, internet is pervasive. The bandwidth is affordable. And uh, th there is 
cheaper bandwidth available. You have Airtel stall right out there, and they're offering two Mbps for an affordable 750 rupee per, per month package, so which is pretty good. So now, instead of someone physically shipping hardware boxes all the way to your location, they will keep the machines there, and you run a thick pipe from your facility to those data centers, which can offer you computing or desktops or servers on demand, right? That is basically the infrastructure as a service promise. So Amazon actually is a, is a, is a great player in this space. What, what do they do? They have huge data centers running in Europe, running in um, USA, and, and very soon in Asia. And once you have a thick pipe connecting to their infrastructure, you can pretty much hire machines. And you pay something like 10 cents per hour per virtual machine, and that's your box. So this is basically infrastructure as a service, hardware as a service. What changed is someone physically shipping in an auto or a truck to keeping the boxes there, but running a thick pipe and, and talking to these boxes. So that's infrastructure as a service for you. Uh, now what happens if this boxes, these boxes actually come with a preloaded platform? So you have all the software. Um, let's say you are a Java developer, so you have a specific checklist. You want all the machines to come with uh, Linux or Windows installed with uh, the latest version of Java, the latest version of JRE, you want uh, Apache Tomcat on it or you want JBoss on it. So someone will pre-install all that and give you access to it. Right? Now, you, you are just not hiring machines which are blank slates to start with. You are actually hiring machines that come with a predefined configuration where you don't worry about what is the underlying version of the operating system, uh, is it patched, is it firewalled, is it secure, um, what antivirus does it run? You don't worry about any of this. You are actually accessing boxes, uh, which gives you the platform that you want as a service. So now, you basically develop it on an expensive machine like the one that I'm using, and then deploy it onto a huge, powerful data center to enjoy the capabilities that these uh, powerful data centers offer. For example, Google App Engine, right? Google App Engine offers you platform as a service for Java developers, and it also has a flavor of Python. So the promise of uh, Google App Engine is you run it on your machine, you, you design it, develop it on your machine, and you deploy it on App Engine, and you get to enjoy the abilities of Google.com for your application. It is scalable, it is reliable, it is secure, and you can pretty much do whatever you want, but you are now running next to Google.com or next to Google's infrastructure, which is an amazing promise and you only pay for what you use. So that is platform as a service. And, and as developers, this is what is very exciting to us. Well, the next layer is software as a service. <clears throat> Guess what? Now, you want, you want boxes, not just installed with .NET or Java, but you want boxes that come with pre-configured CRM, pre-configured uh, HRMS, pre-configured patient information system that you can quickly go uh, configure and put to use. Right? So here, you don't even worry whether it's written in Java or .NET. Uh, for example, I was talking to uh, the, the developer relations team from uh, salesforce.com, and they have uh, an offering called force.com. Right? Now, force.com is platform as a service, but salesforce.com is a ready-made multi-tenant CRM application as a service. You go to salesforce.com, you sign up with them saying, look, I have 100 people who are getting onto the field, and I'm going to pay uh, $5 per employee and give me a CRM out of the box. And in about one hour or so, you have the uh, customized CRM package provisioned for you and you would go live with it. So that's the beauty of software as a service. Now all these are aligned to different personas. Infrastructure as a service is primarily consumed by IT professionals or administrators or IT managers because they get abundant computing power when they sign up for that. Platform as a service is actually meant for developers like you and me. We want pre-configured service, which is either running .NET or, or Python, or sometimes LAMP or Java. Uh, and software as a service is meant for consumers, right? Google Docs is an example. Microsoft Office 2010 Web is an example. Uh, hosted CRM from Microsoft and the business productivity online suite, salesforce.com, uh, all those are the examples of software delivered as a service. So there are certain things that are common to each of them, right? So this is basically cloud computing. And to qualify the term called cloud computing, um, how is it different from uh, a massive data center that you run in your backyard? How is, how is cloud different from a bunch of servers 
uh, running next door? Well, there are four key things that any cloud computing platform should support. Number one, cloud is elastic. It stretches, it compresses on demand. Uh, when you go to Amazon, you can actually scale up to thousands of servers in no time, like Animoto, the way they have gone uh, from, from a dozen, dozen servers to hundreds of servers in no time. Uh, and the same thing happens on Azure or Google App Engine, right? So the elasticity is the key tenet. The second one is pay per use. You don't end up paying for machines that you don't use or resources that you don't consume. You only pay for what you really consume. Microsoft or Amazon or Google won't charge you for things that you haven't consumed or the features that you didn't care to use. They only charge you for uh, CPU cycles that you consumed. They only charge for the storage that you really consumed. So the second important tenet of cloud is it's pay per use. So there is no capital expenditure. Your capital expenditure gets staggered into operational expenditure, which is affordable over a period of time. The third key thing of cloud, it is self-service, right? You don't need a certified IT professional to configure any of this. Most of the cloud offerings are uh, self-service enabled. You can actually go to a portal. Um, you, can, you can actually upload a bunch of files which carry your uh, uh, configuration details. And in no time, the service is up and running. If you sign, signed up with Google Docs, you know what I mean. So you can actually get Gmail for your custom application. And all you got to do is create an Excel file or a CSV file with all the employee names and their uh, required email IDs and their password. And you upload it onto Google Docs. And in about uh, five minutes or so, uh, they will create mailboxes for all the employees. Now, this is no-brainer. And it is self-service. So that's the third key tenet of cloud computing. The fourth one, which is an amazing capability that I really like, is the programmability part. Every cloud um, offering is very, very programmable. Now, they give you uh, very <clears throat> Uh, developer-centric patterns. Uh, I, was, I was actually attending Venkat's uh, session on generic, generics, right, and, and areas and collection. So all of us are familiar with the for each collection, uh, for each iterator pattern. Now imagine doing that on your data center in the cloud. So you would say, for each VM in my VMs, vm.start, vm.stop, vm.add user, vm.add more memory, or uh, for each application in my applications, application.scale. This is not exaggeration. Uh, this is completely possible on the cloud platform. So cloud is absolutely programmable. Uh, you can do it using any of the uh, choices languages out there. And most of the cloud uh, platforms actually come with the API. So just to summarize, uh, cloud can be offered as one of these services. And irrespective of what flavor it is, it got to support four key attributes. They are elasticity. Uh, pay, pay per use, self-service, and programmability. Now, moving straight on to Windows Azure. What is Windows Azure? Well, Windows Azure is the Microsoft's platform as a service offering, right? So uh, Windows Azure is a cloud operating system out there from Microsoft, and it comes with a preloaded .NET runtime. And it comes with everything that a developer needs to, to go live. Uh, so I can design and develop my application using my Windows XP box or Windows Vista or Windows 7. And I can actually port this application or deploy this application onto Microsoft's Windows Azure platform to automatically get the abilities that I want, right? And let me ask you this. I have been talking for five, seven minutes now. I, I'll ask you. So, what, what are the parameters that you consider when you are buying a new machine, either a desktop or a laptop? Processor, absolutely. Then? Storage. OK, let me call that storage, both the primary and secondary. Right? These are the two key parameters for any configuration. Right? So what does cloud ultimately expose? Whether you are using Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Windows Azure, ultimately you are going to talk to two key services. One is compute, the other one is storage, right? So if you have access to these two, you can pretty much do whatever you want. <clears throat> and Windows Azure is not an exception. Windows Azure exposes three different services. One is the compute service, which is just enjoying the raw computing power uh, by writing a few lines of code. And it gives you literally abundant infinite storage. And because 
an operating system is hard to imagine without the management and the security capabilities. Windows Azure also exposes a management service by which you can uh, handle the security, the diagnostics, the, the logs, and various other things. So if you actually look at that, it's like a computer on the cloud. It has a compute offer, it has a storage offer, and it has a management layer. So basically, Windows Azure is the Microsoft's cloud operating system exposing these three services that developers can exploit, right? So, if you actually look at, um, so let me start with uh, the Windows storage, Azure storage part. Now, why is storage on the cloud such a such an important element? You know, for example, Amazon has S3, SimpleDB, and SQS. The simple uh, Simple DB, which is a simple database. Uh, then you have SQS, which is a simple queue system. Then there is something called S3, the simple storage system, right? Or simple storage service. Now, why exactly do we need storage on the cloud? If you actually look at the current application trend, the application that you're building has two, two kinds of data. One data, one part of the data that is more dynamic. But 60% of the data that you typically use or see or consume is static most of the times. So when you are developing an application, that application might be consumed by users coming from desktop, users coming from a mobile, or users coming from a web uh, portal. Now you have certain elements that will go into each of these applications. So it makes sense <clears throat> to actually centralize uh, this data, which is, which is fairly static, doesn't change in a location, and uh, you, you offload all the static data and, and unstructured data, like your media files, your media assets, and so on, to a location, and start using them across all your applications. And if you are going for a hoster, you would actually hit a uh, ceiling somewhere. You, you, it's very expensive. And if you, let's say, you sign up with a hoster like godaddy.com and you get a 10 GB uh, uh, hosting package, uh, there, is, there is no guarantee that you would run short of it. I mean, one day your data might just explode and you might want to go beyond that. Or it might happen that you would just consume 1 GB of the 10 GB offering. In any which ways, you are, the, uh, you are on the losing side because you would pay for systems or, or storage that you are not using or you would actually go beyond the threshold and it takes a lot of time for provisioning. Now, take this scenario to the cloud. Uh, let's say I'm building the next portal, which is a video streaming service, and I want all of you to come upload your custom videos, I'll encode it for you, and I will stream it out of my portal. Now, when I'm a startup, when I'm, I'm in the initial first one year time frame, I don't need a lot of storage. But as I grow, as I become more popular, I'm going to attract more customers and my storage needs will exponentially grow. So how do I handle this scenario? Uh, buying storage from a hoster is not a solution. That's when I look at cloud storage, because I only pay for what I'm going to use, or rather what my customers are going to use. So I will have access to unlimited, infinite storage, and I only pay for what I use. So that's a huge promise. Now, when you are moving your application or data to the cloud, there are a lot of things which are architected differently. In fact, I have, uh, we have another session uh, towards the end of the day by my good friend and, and, and ex-colleague, uh, Praveen Srivatsav, who is going to talk to you about architecting for the cloud. So he's going to talk more about how to architect data-driven applications for the cloud. But at a high level, the data on the cloud can be broken into three pieces. Blobs, which are binary large objects, which, which basically have the, uh, the unstructured data. It, it could be even a serializable Java object or a .NET object, it doesn't matter. But typically, when you want to store your documents, your uh, AVI files, MPEG files, JPEG files, PNGs, PSDs on the cloud, you would actually store them as a blob. So a blob uh, can, can really be very, very large, obviously. It can go up to a uh, few GBs, even to terabytes. It, it depends on uh, the vendor that you're using. But there is a threshold which is very high, maybe uh, 100 GB or 1 TB to, 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 go, to go by. And then you have tables. Now these tables are not like your typical relational tables. The tables that you have here 
are primarily uh, flexible entities. Now, these are called flexible entities because you don't have uh, a predefined row column structure. You can go about adding new columns on the fly. You can go about adding new rows. And every row can have a unique column. So there is, it's very flexible. They're actually called flexible entities. And this will really contain all the metadata uh, for a lot of your applications. Name, value, collection, or uh, a name, value, pair is typically what is expected to be stored in tables. So uh, this can be a good replacement for uh, relational databases. Then you have queues. How many of you uh, worked on web services and SOA, service-oriented architecture? Right. OK, a lot of you. So uh, the fundamental premise of uh, service-oriented architecture is loosely coupled uh, model, right? You never know which component will be called by which component. Uh, so you got to have a mechanism by which you can compose your service infrastructure in a very dynamic form, very dynamic mode. But how do these components talk to each other? You would introduce a message-oriented middleware um, uh, through Sonic MQ or uh, Microsoft Message Queue or IBM's MQ series. There are a variety of applications, uh, services, that actually sit in between the components to enable this loosely coupled communication. Now, this principle is very essential for architecting applications on the cloud. So when you move to the cloud, uh, when you have multiple instances of your applications running, and when you really break them into uh, composable, decomposable parts, queues will enable that kind of a loosely coupled uh, mechanism. For example, you have a web front end. Someone will upload a video. And that video has to pass to, uh, get passed on to another uh, uh, program, which is actually, which has no UI, but which will start encoding this video or decoding this video into a different format. So uh, you want to have reliable delivery. You want to have um, some kind of a logging or journaling mechanism to make sure that uh, you are delivering every object from your web front end to your actual middleware. And that's where queues will be of tremendous help. They ensure one-time delivery, and they give you uh, logs and, and tracking mechanism. So at a high level, the cloud storage, um, whether it's Windows Azure or Amazon, can be classified into binary large objects, Flexible entities, um, which are tables, this is Amazon's equivalent of simple DB. Uh, Azure queues, storage queues, which are again analogous to SQS of Amazon, uh, but, but all of them do exactly the same. By the way, which is um, something beyond the context of this, but you can also have truly relational database on the cloud. Uh, this is called SQL Azure from Microsoft, and you also have MySQL on the cloud offered by Amazon called the RDS, the, the relational database service. That's beyond the um, topic and, and it's slightly off the, off the track, so I'm not going to get there. But this is what is the cloud storage. Now, how do we develop and deploy on Windows Azure? Windows Azure is a, is a very strategic investment from Microsoft. It's very hard to classify Windows Azure as pure platform as a service offering. The reason being, unlike Google App Engine, uh, Windows Azure gives you very, very granular control to the applications that you deploy. Uh, I, I did ask this, but let me ask you one more time. How many of you went live on App Engine? One, two, OK, three. OK, cool. Now, Google App Engine, uh, was it on Python or Java? How many of you deployed it using Java? And Python? OK, very few. OK, now, Google App Engine is a, is a preferred platform as a service offering for Java developers. But my biggest problem with App Engine has been that I have to refactor my application to leverage App Engine's environment. I cannot develop a, a J2E application or a Java web app and deploy it as is. It's very hard because there are a lot of limitations that App Engine imposes. You cannot do multi-threading. You cannot do a um, uh, lot of core computing stuff that you might want. Uh, which might be the real requirement for you. For example, if I want to create a, a, a socket program in Java, and I want to run it forever on the cloud, which will uh, get the stock quotes through a socket from the stock exchange directly, and then does some crunching on it, and then populates a dashboard. If I want to build these kind of an applications on App Engine, it's very, very hard. App Engine is a uh, great platform for hosting pure web, app, web apps or web applications. But even there, there are a lot of limitations. Now, unlike that, Windows Azure gives you a lot of control, a lot of flexibility. 
So Azure, the reason why I said it's, it's hard to qualify it and confine it as a platform as a service is because Azure breaks its, its execution environments into two different roles. One role is called the web role. Now this can be compared to the App Engine's offering because this is a pure play web platform. Um, this is like Microsoft's Internet Information Server and ASP.NET offered on the cloud. Nothing great. Uh, this can be a hosting application as well. But what is very exciting and what is opening up more doors for developers like you and me is the worker role capability. The worker role will, will actually uh, let you write code and execute code that can literally do anything and everything that you expect to do. Um, and, and it's as good as running it on your local box. For example, let me ask you, if you have to develop an application that has, that has to run on any machine, every machine, with, with no dependencies. No, you cannot say, I cannot run on this machine because XYZ components are missing. So you want to create an application that will seamlessly run across platforms um, and there is no installation required. You should be able to uh, just go plug and play and run your app. How do you go about designing such an application? Have you seen portable apps that I carry in my thumb drive? Now, let me apply the same analogy to Java apps. Let me ask you, if I actually create my Java application, compile it to a jar file, package it as a jar file, and I, I ship the entire JRE on my thumb drive uh, with a bash file which will set the environment variables and eventually will launch the application, can I run it on Linux? Windows and maybe Solaris and Mac, I can, right? Because I, I plug in my thumb drive and I execute a .sh file if, if I am on uh, non-Microsoft platforms. I'll, I'll invoke a .cmd file if, I'm, if I am on Microsoft platform and it will bootstrap JRE and on top of that my, my Swing app will load and that is pretty much the portability of the Java, right? Now, how is it relevant to Azure? Well, think of Azure as a, as a, as a computing environment um, on the cloud with a thumb drive, okay? Now, you can literally push whatever you want onto the thumb drive and launch it. That thumb drive is the Azure storage. If I push my JRE, the java.exe, if I push my uh, Java code, there is no UI to it, it, it does some heavy lifting and compute intensive tasks. So I'll push that Java app onto the Azure storage and I'll use a worker role to, to basically do exactly what I do when I plug in my thumb drive. I load Java runtime and then I load the app on top of Java runtime. That's exactly what you can do using the worker role. Now Microsoft has done a phenomenal thing by opening up a worker role with native execution support or native mode. So, you can create applications um, in, in any language that are portable. Perl, Python, uh, Ruby on Rails, or, or a language of your choice. Anything and everything can be ported onto Azure because of the worker role. So worker role will load, it will bootstrap your runtime, and once it bootstraps, you will load your custom application on top of it. So that's the beauty of worker role. So if I am a typical Microsoft developer, what do I do? So um, if I am a typical Microsoft developer, I would be obviously using Visual Studio. So this is Visual Studio. So I'll say uh, file new and project. So typically Microsoft developers target the web windows. Now uh, they also have a new uh, entity that they can target, which is the cloud. Okay, so if you actually notice here, I have uh, windows, web, cloud, and multiple other options. So I will select cloud, and when I say okay, I can choose what role I want to develop. So uh, this is going to be slightly different for Java developers, but, but the concept that I'm trying to do, I um, mean show, is how do, what is the life cycle of a cloud app? So now I would either choose an ASP.NET web role, or I would choose a worker role, or I can also choose a CGI web role. Now this is where I can deploy PHP, Perl, Python, any CGI kind of an environment. Now other things are largely uh, Microsoft specific, like the ASP.NET MV MVC and the WCF, but Either I can go for a web role, worker role, or a CGI web role, and once I add this to my project, 
it is no different from a classic .NET application. So once I actually code my application and thoroughly test it, I have an option to uh, test it locally because there is something called a Windows Azure simulation environment which will emulate the cloud. I will test it locally and then I will go live. So how do I go live? So basically when you sign up with Windows Azure, you have to choose one of these two options. So here, if you actually notice, we have uh, the hosted service, oops, okay? The storage account and the hosted service. Hosted service is the compute environment, and the storage account is actually meant for uh, storing your assets and storing your flexible data. So, so here, uh, you can actually see that I have now created uh, a new Windows Azure storage service called uh, Johnny Jukebox. And the moment I create this Jukebox storage service, I, I have access to blobs, queues, and tables. And Windows Azure is completely open and standards-based. So I can use any REST-based approach to talk to my storage. For example, if I dump my new media files on my Jukebox storage, uh, this is the base URL. And out of that, I can actually create what is called as a container, which will contain all my assets. So I'll uh, append container slash the media file name, and I'm good to go. So this is how you basically sign up for the storage. So now you have uh, signed up for storage. You can also uh, deploy your application. So here, if you actually notice, uh, this is the hosted service environment. And you can click on deploy, which will take you to a screen um, where you can upload the, the application that you have just created. And this is going to be zipped as a package. And that package is called CSPKG file, which is a cloud service package. And you can upload that cloud service package um, along with the configuration file, which will basically tell how many instances your application should be running and what is the runtime configuration. So this is the life cycle from Visual Studio to the cloud all the way. So you develop it locally, and then you click on the um, upload package, uh, upload button, and, and this is where I have, I have compiled my cloud service into these files. You know, uh, don't bother about the CMD files, but I have a configuration file and I have a package file, which will actually uh, deploy my app on the cloud. And once I deploy, uh, it, it, it now becomes available on a specific URL that's available to you, which is your hosted service dot cloudapp.net. So you can also change this to a custom DNS, uh, myapplication.com or mycrm.com or whatever. But uh, you, you initially get a URL. For example, what I designed is a pretty simple clock. So now I get a temporary URL, which is clock.cloudapp.net, as simple as that. So uh, that's, the, that's the life cycle. That's how you go about leveraging Windows Azure as a typical uh, .NET developer. But coming back to the question of how does it matter to Java developers, right? So let me go back to my slide and so this is this is something that we discussed. You either develop a web role or a worker role. So what's in it for Java developers? So this is the this is the primary thing, right? You get unlimited storage, you get unlimited computing power, and you have as is deployment. As is deployment is, for example, I have uh, the Sun Glassfish container, and I went about creating a bunch of var files and a bunch of jar files. I have the, the complete environment configured. Um, one batch file will launch my uh, complete application hosted in this container. Now, unlike Java, uh, Google Java App Engine, I can take this folder, add it to my cloud package, ship it along with my cloud package, put it up on Azure, and I can launch it as is with no configuration changes, right? So as Java developers, you enjoy unlimited storage and unlimited compute capabilities. You can go uh, from one server to hundreds of servers in no time. Uh, and you don't compromise on re-architecting your applications. Of course, if you re-architect for uh, cloud in general, you will get to see the benefits. But more or less, you enjoy the portability from your machine all the way to the cloud with uh, very little changes, right? So um, now I want to break my session into two parts. We'll see, as Java developers, how do you consume Azure storage? See, cloud has uh, two facets. Number one, keep the cloud as an entity and use it as a web service. 
For example, storage as a service, data as a service. As Java developers, you don't care about Microsoft, Azure, but you want someone to give you storage as a service, you can sign up just for that and start consuming it. The other one is literally uh, getting deployed onto the cloud. That's the second part of my demo, but the first part is we'll see how we can literally use the Microsoft storage as an unlimited data store which is up there on the cloud. You're Java developers and you are going to build a jukebox application, uh, something like you know raga.com that I often visit. Um, and what I want to do is I want to upload a lot of files onto the cloud uh, so that the users can stream it and listen to it. Why do I need cloud for that? Why can't a hosting provider give me that? Because I never know how much space I want. And I don't want to end up paying excess storage space for, for the space that I'm not using, or I don't want to get into an issue of the storage not being available. So I want one TB at my disposal, and I want to pay only for what I use. That's the reason why I sign up for Windows Azure Storage as a Java developer. So there are two things that really matter to you. One is there is, uh, uh, an SDK for Java developers, uh, which is available through Windows Azure for J, um, which is a which is a third-party uh, company called Soya Tech that basically built the SDK for Java developers. This is pretty uh, simple. Actually, this SDK makes it slightly more simple, but otherwise. The, the Windows Azure storage is completely REST enabled. So you don't need libraries. If you know how to deal with uh, HTTPS based REST communication, you can pretty much build it by yourself. But this will make it slightly more simpler because there is an abstraction on top of it and you can download it from SourceForge and start consuming the Azure storage. So how do I do that? Now once I download the SDK, let me switch to NetBeans. And once I, I basically get my libraries on my machine, um, so you would actually see that I am using um, the, the r.soyatech.windows.star. Now this is the package um, that you got to import. Th this is the library that will uh, give you access to the Windows Azure APIs. And it comes with a lot of uh, HTTP commons and REST-based libraries, um, which are the dependencies for this. So I downloaded all of those jar files and the libraries. and. Here is my simple application that I built using NetBeans. So I go about uh, importing the namespaces that I want to see, uh, that I want to use in my application. So these are the uh, custom namespaces, uh, the packages that I'm using. So the code that I write is also pretty simple. Uh, let me show you what I do. Or, uh, okay, let's do this. Now, Okay, so let me switch and show you um, the Eclipse IDE. There is, a, there is a beautiful plugin for Eclipse, and this gives you um, access to the Azure storage. Now, what I have done is I created, I already created a uh, blob, uh, I mean the Azure storage service called Jani Jukebox, and I'm just consuming the storage part of it, the, the blob storage part of it, and what I want to do is I want to upload a couple of uh, files. One is basically an MP3, right? So one is um, an MP3 file that has um, some metadata, and I also want to uh, upload the album art that's actually associated with this file, right? So these are the two files that I want to upload onto the cloud, onto Azure, and later on I'm going to stream it out of that. So okay, so one MP3 and uh, an album art associated with it. So what I've done is I built a simple um, application here. So let me launch it. So this is a simple Swing app, which is consuming the Java storage API. I browse to uh, my media folder, okay, and I select track1.mp3. The album is my favorite, which is called Magadira. How many of you watch this movie? Do you like it? I'm going to play that audio for you. Just watch out. That may be the only incentive that you have in the session. Okay. So um, the title is, okay, I don't want to read it out, uh, which will defame me, but I'm going to type it, and those of you who know this audio will know what I'm typing here. Don't worry, it's a track title, which is not very um, relevant. 
Um, so this is sung by Ranjit, uh, who is a new guy. Actually, this is a remix of old Chiranjeevi song. I still like the SP Balu version of it, but for some reason, um, this guy also sang well. So um, the composer is uh, Kiravani. Then I associate this with my um, album art, which is a JPEG file. So it's very simple. I have a simple front end to upload um, the, the details that I want. Now, I'm going to avoid actual upload because I have really um, tough time with the internet connection. But once I click on upload, basically this goes as a blob onto the Azure storage. And this is what you would actually see here. So let me zoom a little bit. So I have created a container by the album name, which is Magadhira. And you actually notice that there are two files, track1.mp3 and, and magadhira.jpg. And each of them are accessible to uh, any web browser. This is the URL, right? So I can actually um, copy this URL and go and type it in the browser. And I can actually get it. I can also turn this to a private container and restrict access only to authenticated users. Now, the, the good thing is uh, this track has metadata. So now, the metadata that I entered in the swing form has uh, uh, been attached to this blob. And the maximum thing that you can have here is a 2 KB limit. So I have my uh, metadata added to the MP3. And both of them will now get stored on the cloud. So this is how I basically consume the storage aspect of it. And then I can, I can actually uh, embed that in my servlets, which is a front end, which will enable end users to go and, and play the audio of it. right? So it's, it's very, very straightforward. So that's how you basically consume the storage SDK um, from Azure. So uh, you can also use the Eclipse plugin uh, to browse the data and the metadata. And you can use the SDK to programmatically access that. So that's one part of the scenario. The second part is, fine, I, I now consumed only the storage part. How do I go one level above and deploy my application on the Azure cloud? Now, this becomes really tricky. This, this is like uh, running Windows on a mainframe. You know, it's, it's not easy. It's not the most expected. But there are few benefits of actually running Java on, on top of um, Azure. So how do we go about doing it? So now, I want to show you something, right? I have a simple Apache Tomcat distribution here. OK, this is very familiar to you. Uh, this is downloaded off Apache site. And um, you know, I can, I can type startup, and it, it basically works. I also deployed my web app onto it. I have done everything that I want. Now what I'm going to do is I will use uh, one of the accelerators um, that Infosys has built. Apparently, this tool is built by Infosys for Microsoft. It's called the Apache Tomcat Accelerator for Windows Azure. What it does is it will prompt you for your Apache directory. It will prompt you for the JRE folder. And it will package your Apache Tomcat folder into a CS package file that Azure can understand. So uh, you know, I can see the source code of it. It's pretty straightforward. It does something very, very simple, right? So what is, what is the accelerator doing here? Um, so remember the thumbnail analogy, the, the, the th thumb drive analogy, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, what the accelerator does is it actually takes the directory where the Tomcat folder is and injects the environment variables onto the Azure environment, right? The Catalina home, Jerry home, and so on and then invoke startup.bat. This is what you do manually in a DOS window, right? Now, the accelerator is precisely doing that. And finally, after it sets up all the parameters, it actually starts the process, which means now the JRE is bootstrapped. And on top of the JRE, you have the Tomcat distribution running. It also does a few more things. For example, it, it manipulates server.xml, uh, which is the key file containing the uh, Catalina configuration. It, it goes ahead and uh, changes some of the XML variables on the fly uh, and uses that configuration to run on the cloud. So basically mapping Azure ports to Apache Tomcat port. That's the reason why when you run Apache Tomcat on Azure, you don't see port 8080. It will inherit port 80 of Azure because the accelerator will manipulate server.xml to, to make Apache listen on port 80, as simple as that. So assuming I have gone through these steps, 
Um, what I want to show you is um, you know, launching Tomcat on my local machine. So let me launch Apache Tomcat. Now what I have done is I already built my servlet, right? So this servlet that I have here um, is very, very, very simple servlet. First thing, I, I use the same Soyatech packages like blob storage, blob container and so on. And here I go about giving my account name, um, which is the storage service. And you need this unique account key to programmatically talk to it. Um, and here I create an instance of the blob storage. Uh, and I am currently getting the metadata for track1.mp3. So this metadata that we entered, like the title, composer, album, album art URL, and so on, will come into the OBJ metadata um, name value collection. Now, I read this. Uh, I, I clean up the metadata because it comes with funny brackets. It may be an early bug. Uh, and then I go about writing it onto my browser stream with all the metadata that I just captured. Right. So here, if you actually notice, um, this is my HTML. And I go about writing the title, the album, the composer, and artist onto my uh, browser output, right? So now, Tomcat is running. Let's open a browser instance and uh, see if this is running. OK, so my Tomcat is successfully running. So now, I have my application called Java on Azure and Jukebox. So this Jukebox app will it's, it's a servlet. It basically pulls the uh, metadata and the URL for the MP3 and, and puts up the basic UI. You know, I, I'm not a great web designer, so uh, I'm not going to show you a very, very uh, good looking jukebox. But hopefully, this will open up if I have the internet connectivity still on. It seems to be the case. OK, it's working. Uh, in a second, you should be able to see the jukebox web page loading. And this is using the same uh, Soyatec SDK that we, are, that we have downloaded. It's the same thing. Now, um, come on. So while it's coming up, so what I've done is, once I tested this application, I used Infosys Tomcat Accelerator, developed by Infosys for Microsoft. I have gone ahead and deployed it on the cloud. So this is how my Tomcat application would look like. So here, if you actually notice, there is only worker role. There is no UI, because the whole of the Java servlet is running as a process, right? Um, this, did this come up? Wow, it's still waiting. Let me give it a shot one more time. OK, so while this is still loading, I think I'll go ahead and launch the cloud application that we already deployed. So I have deployed this application to an endpoint called Azure for Java CloudApp.net. So let me click this. And this will, OK. Now, if you actually notice, this is Azure for Java .net, which means Tomcat is now not running locally. It's running on Azure. Did you see that? Did you get that? And I just took that whole folder, packaged it, and pushed it onto the cloud. Now I'm going to type the Java on Azure jukebox. And this should be faster. OK, my local host is still not responding. But hopefully, this guy should come up and uh, show me the URL. OK, there we go. So now it basically downloads uh, the same album art that we uploaded and shows the metadata. And I integrated a simple Flash player. And when I actually click the Play button, it goes ahead and plays the audio. So this is like a complete experience of creating a swing app to push the metadata and the data to the cloud and building a servlet to consume that and then packaging it in, packaging that and going all the way to the cloud and deploying it on the cloud, right? So um, this is basically the scenario. All right, so that actually brings us towards the end. So if you want to learn more about it, go to microsoft.com slash Windows Azure. That's your primary resource. And uh, if you want to download the SDK, Windows Azure for J.org, um, the Windows Azure Tomcat Accelerator is available from this URL. Uh, Steve Marks, who is the uh, technical strategist sort of Azure team, is a, is a great guy. He blogs a lot on interoperability and Java on Azure. 
um, I plan to upload the PPT, the demos, and, and some more stuff on my blog. And that's my email ID, janakiram m, uh, mail at janakiram.m.net. And my Twitter handle is at janakiram.m. So I can take a uh, couple of questions. One, one question, okay. Yes. On the very front end, uh, security, that's like, uh, let's uh, uh, speak of like HTTPS 128 or like uh, the other uh, secure models. A mm -hmm. lot of uh, enterprises use third party applications to uh, keep a single sign on between uh, the Apache, Jakarta, and everything. Right. So how does uh, Azure mm -hmm. uh, work out when uh, policies are rolled out with a certain limited amount of trusted hosts right. and how it can leverage up to the... Uh... Perfect, perfect. Very valid question. So if I have to rephrase your question, you're saying enterprises already have some kind of an authentication mechanism. How do I extend it securely, limitedly to the cloud, right? So. Uh, in terms of Windows Azure, there is something called Windows Azure Platform App Fabric. Okay. App Fabric has um, a component called Access Control, mm -hmm. which will help you bridge the cloud security and the enterprise security. So even if you are running uh, your single sign-on or LDAP service behind the firewall, you can securely extend it to the cloud through the Access Control component of App Fabric, and you can actually have your employees log on to your corporate network from the cloud and pass the credentials back and forth. Okay. Uh, just, just go to Windows Azure portal and read about access control. Uh, there is a beautiful white paper that actually articulates how you can go about it. But you can pretty much plug and play any third party authentication engine into the access control scheme of things. Okay. Okay? So unfortunately, I don't have any more time. I'm, I'm around. So I can, I can talk to you offline right after the session. So thank you so much for attending this. I hope you enjoyed it.